I'm doing good, buddy. Doing real good. I am um, coming out of the fog of uh, the holidays and, you know, life transitions and my house is coming together and life is good, you know? Yeah, man, you've uh, had a lot going on, haven't you? Yeah, that seems to be what the universe has lined up for me. So I've decided to embrace it. And, um, and you know, I don't like to complain in general. So I just tend to keep moving forward. And that seems to work pretty well. And uh, if, you, if you don't complain, I'm actually reading an awesome book. Have you ever read uh, The Gap and the Gain by Benjamin Hardy? Um, my dad's talked about it a lot. This is like, I think, uh, Dan Sullivan from strategic coach probably referenced it. Yes. So Um, it's a Dan Sullivan concept. So, so there's this really cool series of books that I highly recommend anybody who's like growth focused and, and like read. And, and these have been, I've read two of them. I'm going to read the third. Uh, it's not, it's not as high on my priority list because I think it's one of the concepts that I just intrinsically understand a little more. But I read, uh, there's three books. So Dan Sullivan has all these ideas. And Dan Sullivan's strategic coach is incredible, but it's so much. He partnered with a guy by the name of Ben Hardy, Benjamin Hardy. And and yeah. and is, he's a doctor. Uh, he, uh, well, not the like medicine kind, like the philosophical kind or whatever. Um, and he wrote, he basically took these three concepts and broke them down into a series of books. I'm reading them in reverse order. So the one I read was 10X is easier than 2X, which which was my best and number one recommended book for 2023. Just absolutely incredible. And now I'm reading The Gap and the Gain. And, and then the first one that they did in the series was Who Not How, which people rave about as well. Although, if, you know, like I said, I, I just feel like intrinsically that's a concept I understand a little better. But this this The Gap and the Gain is really interesting because it was like, you know, I'm only, I'm only four chapters in, to, to, to be fair to the book, but uh, when they first introduced the concept, it like hit me like a ton of bricks that it like completely defined when I feel good about something and when I don't feel good about something. And the concept was, is basically we have where we started, where we're at, and our ideal. And what most people do is they measure themselves between where they're at and the ideal, and that's called the gap. And what they and what Dan Sullivan recommends is measuring yourself from the start and where you're at, and he calls that the gain. And that if you're always operating in the gain from saying like, hey, I used to be able to run a nine-minute mile or a 10-minute mile, and now I'm running a nine-minute mile, and even though my best friend can run a seven-and-a-half-minute mile, I'm actually a minute quicker than I used to be. And I should be happy for that one minute gain. Not the fact that I'm still, you know, a minute and a half behind my, my friend. And, um, and you know, the, and the reason I like this concept, and then we'll talk about something relevant to why you're on. But, um, the reason why I like I just I read it for like an hour this morning. I like couldn't put the book down. I almost my kids were almost late to school because I was like, I couldn't put it down. Um, the reason I like it is because, and this is what they were getting into was this idea that, uh, and it's something I've been talking about, it, success is often just outlasting, you know, outlasting your desire to quit, not necessarily, you know, hitting some mark. And and that's really what Dan Sullivan's concept is, is that as leaders, as entrepreneurs, as growth-focused people, when we operate in the gap, we get frustrated, we get, you know, we get depressed, we start having negative thoughts, and, and, and that's where we oh, I'm going to give up or I'm going to make a bad decision where in the gain, you're always coming from a place of positivity because you're like, yeah, our goal may have been 300 customers by the end of the year, but we started with 50 and now we're at 275. And even though we missed our goal by 25, geez, we put 225 new customers on the books and that's that's pretty darn good. And I just thought that's, um, I, I've just, that kind of stuff like really just resonates with me. I know it's kind of ethereal, but I like live off that shit. No, yeah, it's it's funny. My so my dad did strategic coach for I don't know a decade or something, and um, he he taught me about gapping the game when I was in high school. He'd be like, Peter, you're gapping on me. You're gapping on me. Um, so it's funny because he's he's been talking about the book. I've never read it. I probably should, but uh, the concept. I think he did a great job explaining at least how I've how I've learned it. Um, are you a big reader? You know, uh, recently, honestly, Ryan, like haven't been. 
Um, and it's, it's one of those things where I'm like, I should make time for it. Um, but, uh, I've, I've just been, it's like, I have, ki- I have young kids and then the startup and it's just like, wake up, get the kids off work and then kids go to bed, like back to work. Yeah. So it's one of those habits where I'm like, ah, I should probably make time for it. I also think like, you know, you, I know my brother reads like a, a book a day, a book a week. I know you're a big reader. Um, I feel like, I feel like some of the times you read books and you're just like, man, there's so much filler content. Mm-hmm. There. Like they could just condense these things down to like you know, a quarter of what's in there. And then I think, and you commented on that thing I posted from Daniel Goggins. Cause I do, I do read a ton by the way. Like I'm on Twitter a lot. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on, I'm like reading a ton of news stuff relevant to the industry. So I do, I do read a ton, just like not necessarily books. Yeah. And I do listen to a lot of podcasts. I love audio. I, I you know, listen to audio or videos at 2x speed. Cause it's just like, it's so much better. But that Daniel Goggins, he, he's like, you already know what to do. Like, just go do it. Like yeah. if you're trying to build a business. It's like, just go get those 300 clients. Like, yeah. It doesn't matter if half of them come from cold calling and half of them come from an intro and you know, whatever. It's like, just go, like, you know what you need to do. Just go do it. Yeah. And so um, I do love reading. Man, if I could get into reading right now, I feel like I'd want to read like The Hobbit or something or like Lord of the Rings. You know, it wouldn't even be like a business book. It'd be like, I need to just escape yeah. and unplug. You know what I read? Uh, and, I, I was, I read, um, oh my gosh, not 1984, um, Brave New World. I have. I have that right behind me, but I literally had it like on my background, 1984. Yeah. Both great books. Yes. So I've read 1984 a long time ago, uh, just after I finished college, but not for the reasons that I would read it today. I read it mostly for the story, um, not with the political undertones. I just didn't understand all the right. complexities that were interwoven into the narrative, um, which is a great story. Just if you're not even reading it for like the, the political commentary, the, the right. narrative is phenomenal. Um, I will say, and, and I almost feel like my understanding of, of, of the political undertones of Brave New World uh, wrecked the story for me a little bit. It's a great book, and I, and I loved it. I, I finished it maybe like it's a, like It's like real life too much. You're like, hey, but, this is like the, reading the Yeah. Paper. Unfortunately, today, because <sighs> I want to say, I do, I hate to say this because I know like every guru success expert is like, don't listen to f- politics and don't get involved. I, I do enjoy I, so if I go back and do my do my it's like hard not to yeah if I could go back and do my my college career again I would have done economics and psychology because I love business I love how business works but I also would I you have love, gone to college what <laughs> if you did it again you know what I mean? would you have gone to college you know uh, did it again in that day without the internet without the access to information right. that exists today now today like if I were to go in 2024 would I go to college if I wasn't playing sports I would not have gone to college today. Um, yeah. I also think that it's like, it's like a country club. It's like a country club with some, like yeah. an academic component and like networking. Yes. Yeah. I, I given the option today without sports. So at the time, you know, I, I have talked a little bit about this. I came from this little shit town of less than 900 people. My parents did the best I can. I was blessed that I had two parents that loved me, but they had nothing. Right. So for me, college was like the only way I could envision getting out of that little shithole. So like, yeah. that was it. Like playing sports, even though I love them was like my way out. Getting good grades was like yeah. my way out. It wasn't that I loved school. I mean, I did love sports, but like it was how I got out. So so back then, yes, just to like escape. But to be honest with yeah. you, I love I love economics and financial shit and I love psychology. So like so like I get into politics not so much for like the like my side winning or whatever. Like cause I don't really have a side because I flip flopped so many times. If you were to like look at my political register, you know, what I've registered, I've been Democrat, independent, Republican, independent, Republican, independent, Republican, Democrat, independent, Republican. I mean, it's like that. And cause it's more for me, like I just, the psychology of how all this stuff works and like how you could say something and I could say it in the way you look, how you deliver it, the timing, the venue, the color shirt you're wearing, who's standing next to you or behind you, how loud the crowd cheers when you say, all these things impact whether I believe you and don't believe me or believe me and don't believe you. And like, that's what I find fascinating is like, why? Like, why is that the case? I just, I don't know, I'm so intrigued by it. I think I think that the smartest people are like the hermits. They're like the prophets who go out into the wilderness and they just shut themselves off. Um, and I know people like this. They're like, uh, don't don't read the news anymore. Don't watch it because it's all made up. 
Yeah. And I and I and they go off and they have these these breakthrough ideas because they're not bombarded with the thing of the day. Yeah. And there's so many things of the day and it just gets your blood to boil if you feed into it and you start bleeding all the conspiracy theories that are out there. And I know you and I chatted about like aliens and other things yeah, that yeah. are out there, but like um I think as a leader you need to be well versed in it. Yeah. Um you need to know what's going on with sports. Like if you look at someone who's running for president, it's like they got to throw that pitch to open the game and like they need to know who's like who's going to the Super Bowl, who's going to the playoffs, who are they rooting for. Yep. Um it's just like one of those things where you kind of have to be it's almost like you have to be aware of it and operate your business within it without getting mentally sucked into it. Yeah. Which is which is the challenge. Dude, I think it's uh seasons of your career, right? When you are in a like I remember the early days, and I'm sure with Wonder Right it's the same thing. And I and I want to talk about Wonder Right. I want to talk about the industry a lot. So I don't I don't want to get too. I know sometimes when we get on here and these shows like we go off the rails. I, I want to talk. I I'm very interested in some of your takes on some of the things that are going on in the space, and I want to get to that. But and I have some notes too, by the way. I, I prepared. Right. Oh I yeah, and I love I love it. I love it. I love that. <laughs> um, but this this idea, and I'd like your thoughts on this. Like so. In examining my own career, obviously I've had, if like you look at my LinkedIn, you're like, what, you know, I did this, I did this podcast. I got invited on this like entrepreneurs podcast randomly by two guys I didn't know. And it was, it was a lot of fun. And uh, they were asking me, they saw the like rogue story of like the startup and the insurance industry. And they were, they were interested in like entrepreneurial stories and what they were calling like uh, almost like Cody Sand, like boring businesses kind of thing. Right. And um, yeah, sure. And, and it was, and, and that's where they brought me on. And then they're yeah. like, well, give us the 10 cent tour of how you got to here. And I was like, I don't know that I can tell it with 10 cents, but I'm going to do the best that I can. So I broke down like the last 18 years of my life and the guys got done and they like had nothing to say. And I, they're like, holy shit, like that's quite the journey that you've been on. And I was like, yeah. So so I reflect on that quite a bit. And what I've come to is this idea. And I'm very interested because you are obviously – past initial startup phase, but still probably still feel very much in that startup mode and growing wonder, right? But I feel like we have to be very intentional with the season of our career. And what I mean by that is in the early days of Rogue, I mean, I mean, you couldn't avoid COVID, but other than that, a bomb could have went off in the, in my town and I wouldn't have known, right? I'm 16 hours a day. Like you said, if the kids aren't awake and home, I am my computer doing some sort of work trying to grow my business Literally. and I didn't know anything else that was going on and then as I kind of started to add some employees and hit a next phase and and I don't know that we ever actually we were almost at escape velocity when when rogue was shut down but but we did get to a point where I had to pick my head up and start to say what's going on in the industry what's going on with the economy what is this hard market all about how are we going to position our business you know like I had to take my head out of like that what you like that hermit mentality and engage because otherwise there were there would be blind spots that I could run my business into and I think that we have to be very cognizant of that if if you want to be that high level leader of an organization I don't think you can have your head in the sand if you want to be that unique disruptive creator then going into the woods maybe is the best play for you and, and, and being smart about those things. Does that make sense? And how do you feel about that? No, a hundred percent. I think, um, by the way, you talk to any startup founder, and I know you've gone through this, like there's a season where you need to go fundraise. Yeah. Um, people think that you're always fundraising and that's not true. Like for, for the, I think for the best, it's like you might be building relationships, but like honestly, like the best investors, like you don't necessarily need a relationship. It's like, if this is a great investment, I want to, I want to buy right now. I don't yes. care about the relationship that I've had historically. And so when I go into fundraise mode, it's like all I do the entire day until midnight every day yeah. is fundraise activity. Yep. It's like, and, and I stack my calendar morning to night, meeting after meeting, after meeting, after meeting. That's all I do. You get and, and you get really good at the conversations. They get better every time. You get a sense of the market, and I block everything else out. There's nothing else that I do. I ignore everything. I ignore my emails. I ignore my texts. Nothing. I remember in the earliest days of Wonder I, Ryan when I was literally coding, I couldn't check my email. I just I, I, I would wake up and I would I would just code all day and I'd code all night, every day. And you ignore everything. Like that's the way that you get to be successful. Yeah. I think that the hermit mentality is like, it's like you go out. You shut off everything and you just, you focus and that's where you get, you know, the brilliance. But on the flip side, when you come back and all of a sudden you're running an organization, you need to be aware like, hey, and this is one of the things I'll talk about that I see coming this year, like what's happening with non-competes? 
what's happening with pay transparency. Yep. These are like political issues we need to be aware of. Some of them, it's like they might be like, you know, maybe m- more make your blood boil where it's more of a current, you know, current issue, social work setting, layoff stuff that's going on. Like it's, it's good to be aware of, but it doesn't really impact your business. But like if you're an insurance, like, hey, what's happening with non-competes? New York just shut it down. Yep. Like California is accelerating it. Massachusetts, like w- w- what does that mean for me? What does it mean from hiring? So there's things that, like, that are good to be aware of. But for the most part, I would 100% agree. Like you just you just got to shut it out of your mind and just focus on what you need to do right now. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I get asked a lot, if your agency was so successful, why did you sell? And there's a bunch of reasons. One reason that I don't talk too much about because I am not in any way a financial guru. So I do not want to even, you know, even pretend to position myself as such. But I will tell you that part of the reason that I sold when I did had to do with the fact that I saw hard financial times coming because I read, I have like, I have like a half dozen independent financial journalists that I read. They're, they're not MSC. It's not Jim Cramer. It's stuff that I get directly to my inbox. Two of them I actually pay for every month. And I read these things in my downtime because, because I feel like this cross cut of individuals, you know, give me a good feel for what's happening and no one ever knows exactly what's happening. But what I did know for a fact, back in 2022, something was coming, right? Some We had seen some initial rate increases. There was COVID had impacted us in a way. And I was like, you know what? If I don't raise money and or sell this business today, what am I going to be able to do two or three years from now? Like, what is this going to look like, right? And we had to make a move because for, for different reasons. So there were other variables, but it was like, and then you see people in 2023, talking about how they didn't see the hard market coming or what do we do about this hard market? It's like, guys, if you had, had if you were had your head up, right, and had been, you know, I'm not talking every minute of every day scanning the environment, but if you had been looking a little out ahead and reading some things and being aware of your environment, maybe you could have started position your agency, position your business in, in a way, whether you're raising funds or just the products you're selling, how you're setting up your employment or your your staff, you know, et cetera. You could have made some adjustments to handle these huge rate increases and some of the some of the disruptions that have come from them. And again, no one can prognosticate what's going to happen in the future. But I do think, to your point, as a leader, we have to. It is it is mandatory that we every once in a while put our periscope up and see what the heck is going on. Yeah, I, I think if you've seen that movie, The Big Short. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. I think Christian Bale and he he predicts like. He predicts, you know, basically the mortgage crisis. Yes. And he profits from it. And I think that's the perfect example. Like like this crazy guy who doesn't wear shoes in the office (laughs) blocks himself off. And he he figures something out that the the, the biggest banks in the country are laughing at him. Yeah. And that's where I think, and this is where I think, Ryan, where, where I think you've done a great job is, you know, being true to yourself. I think you've always kind of looked internally and been like, you know, who am I? What do I want? And you haven't been, you haven't been, uh. I think a lot of people self-censor themselves on their thoughts and whatnot. I think you've done a good job of like, this is who I am and this is what I believe and this is what I know. So yeah, I agree. You got to kind of know what's uh, what we think is coming in the, in the next you know year, two, three years. Yeah, I uh, some of that might be the hardcore ADHD, ADD that I have that I just can't stop my mouth from moving. And if I don't keep it moving at all times, then all those thoughts get bottled up in my head and I start to get crazy. That could be what it is. Who the hell knows? Um, but dude, you took notes. So I'm interested. What did you take? You came prepared. I, I'm I'm going to let you drive this. What 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 uh, was so relevant to your mind that you wanted to do some preparation on? I'm excited because guys, in case oh, you don't dude. know, and I will have said this in the <laughs> intro, we have one of the smartest dudes in the industry on 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 the show today. I absolutely adore Peter and the way his brain works. And plus, on the sneak, when you get a when you get a pop in him, he's also a conspiracy theorist which makes me enjoy and admire him even more. But we won't, we're not going there today. We won't go there today. I want to talk, we want to talk insurance. So, so what was the first thing that came to your mind, man? Let's, let's dig into it. Um, yeah, I think the, the conspiracy theories, Ryan, man, it's just, it's, uh, I don't believe a ton of conspiracy theories, but I think that you can't believe everything that's on the surface. Oh. And like, like, it's just, it's like, there's just too many things where it's like, and, I, and by the way, I tell my kids this. My, ki- my kids are in uh, preschool and in second grade and then even younger, you know, baby. But I'm like, they'll tell me things. And I'm like, why do you believe that? I think this, a skill that we need is to ask questions mm-hmm. and, and to um, think critically. 
Um, that, that is the number one skill you need to learn in school is like think for yourself, think critically, just don't accept the answers that are given you. Like you, you have to think. Yes. Um, it's, I think it's okay to like, when your doctor tells you something, it's okay to be like, hey, net, net, like I probably should listen to my doctor. Um, but you got to think critically. <laughs> so yeah. I think that's why conspiracy theories are so interesting and, and probably just like, if nothing else, they're just fun mental gymnastics to think through. That and most of them have ended up being true recently. So, you know, I think that's the yeah, other exactly part that's, so. that, oh, we I love how every the, Thanksgiving the now, the meme is, uh, me, you know, yeah. it'll be like some guy like walking in all happy and it'll be like me walking into Thanksgiving dinner with all my relatives who, do, who told me I was crazy for my conspiracy theories. You know what I mean? And then it's like the list of all the things that actually, right. that actually were true. Right. Um, you know, this is also, so that's basically what you're advocating for. And I completely, I'm, I'm with, is like the Socratic method, which is basically just that yeah, continuing exactly. to ask why until you can't ask why again. And I'll tell you, I saw Jordan, one of the guys who I think embodies this, and it's why I love him so much in terms of like following him and listening to him. And, and I don't agree with everything this guy says, but Jordan Peterson, I saw him live this year. Uh, Chris Paradiso invited me to an event out in Utah. Uh, and I went along. Wasn't he just censored in Canada or something? Yeah, C Canada is basically a communist country at this point. I can't even stand it. Um, the So we went to Utah, and Jordan Peterson was speaking at this event live. And you got to see this dude. I mean, I, I think you would really appreciate the way he works. I mean, you can. it's cool to watch him on video, but dude, live, he is working through a problem. I mean, obviously, it's a problem he's thought about and talked about before, but you can see him... Literally, he's asking himself, he'll say something and then he'll, you can literally see him asking himself, why did I say that? Do I believe that? And then he'll either reframe it or he'll ask himself another question to go deeper. And like, he's basically operating the Socratic method on himself in real time as he works through these thoughts. So by the end, like if you were to take where he starts and where he finishes, it isn't the standard speaker stump speech where it's like i'm gonna start here and then i'm gonna say this and then i'm gonna say this it's like he starts with an idea and like he kind of wants to get somewhere over here but how he gets there and exactly where he ends is 100 percent based on him working through this process in real time it is freaking amazing to watch and you can tell that's cool and you just can tell how honest it is whether you agree with him or not you could think his conclusion is completely crap and you don't believe it but you what you do believe, and I think this is important for people who are in leadership positions as well, when you work this method that 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 you're de that you're describing, people believe that you believe it, which I think is incredibly important, right? They believe that you are giving them your honest take on this topic, and I think that's almost more important than whether I agree with you or not it, I, in today's world, right? Because you just don't know who's telling you the truth. No. You gotta be able to think critically. You gotta be able to put yourself in the other person's shoes, mm -hmm. and like think through from their perspective, steal man the argument. But yeah, so I think Ryan, you had texted me. I think I was on like ski vacation yeah. um, with my kids. Which we're gonna right do this New winter. Years. We are going to get we're out gonna, this winter. I promise. I've already been out nine. I've been out I nine days. You. It's middle of January. I've been out nine days, and like it's, I, I basically I went all in. Like we're doing it. Seasons pass. Like we're going every weekend. Um, but you were like, hey, you want to come on the podcast and discuss what you see happening in 2024? That yes. was kind of the text. And so I'm like, yeah, like, what do I see coming? And then I'm like, what do I see coming? And I'm like, I'm, it's one of these things where I'm like, I'm right now I'm the hermit working on the, the business, yes. like just like in the weeds. And I'm like, dude, I, I haven't even thought about that. Um, I probably should think about what I see coming. I know what I see coming from my business, but I think like, so when you said like, hey, what, what notes have I taken? I just, I put down a few thoughts. I think one of the things that I see is data warehouse slash data lake. So in the insurance world, every conversation, every top brokerage is talking about like data warehouse, data lake. So for those who aren't initialized, like a warehouse is like, just think about like an actual warehouse. It's like you have this stuff that lives in it and it's like packaged and like ready to go, ready to use. So if you have a lot of data, packaged, ready to go. A lake is like, yeah, you have this data, not necessarily structured, but it's there. You could use it later at some point. It's like raw data. And I think as agencies, um, you know, we're all excited about AI, you know, we see it, we know there's a huge potential. We think about voice, you know, interfaces, we think about training AI models. We think about targeting prospects better, identifying prospects better. I think right now you go to the average agency and I know this because we work with hundreds of them and we look at their data when we do integrations, like the data is a mess. Um, even our own, even at Wonderwrite, our own sales force, like 
is it, do we use New York or do we use NY? Um, do we use USA or United States? It's like small little things and you have to go through systematically thousands and hundreds of thousands of records. So I think we have bad data um, across the industry, maybe a key contact left. There's just a lot of issues. But so if you can get that data in a clean spot, how do you take all that data to run your agency much better. I think for agents, we've, we, agents, we've had an AMS system like AMS 360 or Epic or whatever. We have a sales CRM, Salesforce or agency Zoom. And then we have a forms tool like an Indio or a Wonderwrite. You have a website and web chat. You have photos and videos, you have contacts, like all this stuff. How do you like, how do you use that to advance your business? Um, I think that the big picture theme is if you think about the customer journey, how do you make a seamless customer journey um, for your customers from beginning to end. And it's not going to happen if you have things living and, well, if you have 20 different systems to make the, the experience happen, you, like how do you get that data to live and talk to each other? I don't even know. So I don't know how to like make this whole thing work. I just know that I hear this. It's, it's definitely, you know, people are talking about it. They want to basically get a place to have all their data where they, whether it lives in your AMS, whether it lives in your Salesforce, whether it lives in your LinkedIn or whatever, or any correspondence or email, how do you pull that data, extract it, and do what you need to do before you get back to your, your team or your customer? So that's probably one of the biggest themes that I've heard that I, I, I would double down on for 2024. And I don't know how relevant it is for small agencies. I mean, they still have the same challenges. I just don't know how to solve them at scale. Um, Can I ask you a technical question? To. I want to ask you a yeah, technical question sure. about data warehouse and data like, and, and this is this is an honest question that I that I've just always wondered. When it comes to data uh, quality, and, and the the really kind of uh, specific example that you give, do you use in your AMS? Do you use NY or New York or NY State or whatever? Right? Like, what what do you use in that field? And you know, we we you can even see this if you run a reporting agency management system and one of your CSRs is using NY and your producer is putting New York and you run a report and you're like, where's all our New York accounts? And it's like, oh wait, we also have to run a separate report for the right. Okay, right. So, yeah. And and again, this is uh, uh, neophyte. This is a naive question I'm I'm asking. Why is there not? Uh, a like Google has like semantic search, right? I remember back in like the early 2012 to 2014, a big, a big uh, leap in search functionality was semantic search, where if I typed New York, Google knew that NY in a page meant New York. So if I typed like best insurance in New York, Google could, Google knew that if I had created a video that said, best NY insurance, that those were the same thing, that that person was asking the same question. That's like semantic search is what they called it. And again, I'm uh, naive, so I'll clean up my speech if, if you need to. Why can't we do that? Like, why isn't there an algorithm or a bot or something in our industry that you can run through our AMSs and, and clean that shit up? Like, then it doesn't matter whether Tammy's writing NY and Tommy's writing New York the 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 semantic you know this 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 bot can tell that they're the same thing like I guess what what is the holdup to that or or is there or maybe that exists I don't know yeah I mean I, I think that broadly the issue is economics um, I, I've just come like if you you know I think you said you, you're interested in economics right like you'd study yeah if you went back to college I think the insurance is the prime industry that's driven by economics you have thousands of competitive um, companies that. From you know a high level perspective, not that it's a commodity product, but it's like it's more or less the same who you buy it from. Obviously, you can have risk management and whatnot, but it's like there's so much in general commoditization. I know again differentiation. You want to sell differentiated process, win through broker of record, etc. I'm not saying that's not fair and true, um, but it's commo It's it, it's it's literally it's just like driven by economics, and it's such a vast industry so and then it comes down to like the economics of your insurance agency like how much money are you as an agent willing to, to spend on stuff and i think the reality is and i think you actually asked this question when, when we did the ceo panel back in august at indie tech yep the question that you kind of rudely grabbed the microphone well you didn't you didn't know you were supposed to grab i didn't the know i was supposed to not of, ask live questions i didn't know that i said can i ask a but question you were like how did sure <laughs> yeah but you basically were like how do you build, and, and this is for the leaders of, you know, I think Vertifor and Applied and Ivans, you're like, how, how do you build a product when, you know, a third of your customers or a quarter of your customers are the leading edge customers, but the, the middle does like, doesn't care, won't care, can't implement. Yeah. 
And I think so the reality is how, how many agents out there would raise their hand and be like, I want this tool yeah. and, and implement it. And I, I, if you're listening to this right now, you're like, oh, I would definitely want that. I would want clean data. It's like, well, there's a company right now called Relativity 6. Yeah. You, uh, you've interviewed them. Yep. Like, you, you, so if you listen to Ryan Hanley, you, like, you probably should know about Relativity 6. But they can literally like, just tell you like, what the appropriate NAICS codes are for mm -hmm. all your customers. Like the end, yeah. um, pro programmatically. And so I think that like the, the tools are out there. It's just the economics of like, are people interested in hearing about them and paying for it? Um, and the answer is no. And, it's, and it's, it, it, it's a huge market, but it's also a small market when you compare to like Google's looking at like every business in the world, yeah. not just like insurance agencies in the United States. You know, it's funny. Um, I, I, love, I love this. So obviously customer journey, all this that this is like core to what i love it's you know all my work comes back to how do we create this experience for our customers that maximizes their lifetime value for us so so it's not just the the uh uh virtuous you know i want you to be happy as a customer if you're happy as a customer it maximizes my lifetime value or your lifetime value Absolutely. to my agency so that's that's why i enjoy this process that being said one of the things that I found over and over and over again is as much lip service as we give to data, you, our industry, I believe, is unique in this one characteristic is it doesn't matter, right? Like you write the business with the carrier, the carrier sends you a check and you cash the check. Does it matter how much data you have on the client? It really, to be six, now there is a certain level where I think you start to, there's a diminished return on crappy data. But when you're in the early, this is, and th I think this is a big part of the problem is in the early stages when you're grinding it out and you got to sell every policy you can just to, just to put enough revenue on the books to keep the lights on and keep going, to slow down and make sure you have good data quality is not an option. It's just, it's quite literally not an option to move that slow. And then what happens is you get to, 500,000, 750, a million dollars in revenue where now you can maybe exhale a little bit depending on how your operation is set up. And you're like, oh my God, my data is horrible, right? I have some just in carriers, some's in my agency management, some's just in my CRM, some's in my phone in text messages, personal text messages to my clients, right? right. And, and, the, and then you go, oh my God, it doesn't matter because I'm making this amount, which I never imagined I would make. And, but, and all of a sudden you're like, eh, why, why I got to spend 50 grand to clean all this up and that, for what, right? So unless you're trying to go, and I think this is, and I, I really think this is the answer to the question is that you have to decide, like, are you shooting for a number and a lifestyle or are you trying to grow something um, that is bigger than that? And, and depending on what you, you know, and that's a, that's a goal you have to decide. Some people want to grow big enterprises and, and that's what they want to do. That's phenomenal. I think in that case, stepping back, doing things like cleaning up data, really focusing on customer journey matter. If all you care about is making enough money to provide a lifestyle for yourself and your family, then you don't need any of that. You could run it all off a spreadsheet or off your phone. The carrier's got all the data. You can just log into their back end. You literally don't even need to have an AMS or a CRM or any of it. You have Wonder right for the forms that you need. The carrier sends Let's you the go. things in the mail, and that's all you freaking need. I mean, honestly, I don't know that you need more than that to to, to get to. We need a to. We, we 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 need. You know that. You know. That I need to do a meme generator. You know, like the bell curve meme, where yes. there's like the like the the total like whatever loser on the left and the total like like whiz kid on the right yeah. with the hoodie on, and then the like the weird mid guy in the middle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's like the middle? It's like the middle guy is like, uh, I need clean data and I need to spend all this money to clean everything up. And like the guy on the left and the guy on the right of the bell curve are just like, sell more insurance. Yeah, sell right? more insurance. Like if you want to make more money and run a great business, like just sell more insurance, yeah. right? But on the but on the edges, it's like, or, or you know, it, the, the part about the clean data is like, if you really care about this stuff, like once you get to a million dollars or $2 million in revenue, now it's like, hey, how do I optimize my yes. placement in my book of business? Because I can get an extra point of commission yep. by like getting rid of my bad carriers and only working with the good ones, right? Yeah. There's just like so much stuff that you can do. And again, for the most part, it's like if you try, if you start to really focus on that and you distract yourself from just sell more insurance, like you probably could be losing. But that's why I said in the beginning with data warehouse for the really big agencies that have scale, that point really, really matters. Yeah. 
And so they, you, ha- you, and you can afford to employ teams where that's all they think about, customer journey, like optimizing their, their, their book of business placement. But the producers, the sales people, like they're not, they're not necessarily looking at that. Yeah. They're just like, how do I sell more business? And, and really they shouldn't be. I think it's, the leader, I think it's leadership's job to, 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 make those, to, to make those decisions. I mean, I was, um, I was talking to, um, the, it wasn't a top 100 broker, but they were probably top 250. It was uh, like a vice president, regional vice president, whatever. We're just chit-chatting. And in his region, they used four different agency management systems. So as a producer, you could be in one, you know, in one segment of that region, you could be working on an account in applied and then have a renewal for another account in Vertifor and then another one's in uh, or AMS 360, another one's in Sajida. And you're just like, I'm like, oh my God. Like, just just think about That's that. data warehouse, by the way. Yeah. Cause like I think well, there's one idea which is like, hey, like get everybody in the same AMS, and it's like, you know how much like you know how much like people are gonna cry, oh and, like, my how many gosh, gallons yeah. of tears you're gonna have. It's brutal. So like, what if you're just like, hey, you know, what? let's just keep all the AMSs in like data warehouse. And I think I, the data can live in sales CRM, it can live in Vertifor, it can live in Epic. Who cares? And I think there's people trying to do this. Uh, it is definitely the agency management systems are fighting it. I think some people have tried to do it with Salesforce. I do not think Salesforce is the tool to do this. It's too big. It's too expensive. And uh, and I and I don't think it's the answer. I do think there are companies out there trying to solve this problem and probably could if the vendors of the industry wanted to solve it. I'm not just blaming the agency management system. But, right? I'm, so, I, but let's just talk about your yeah. example, right? You're talking about a sales guy. You're like, hey, my sales guy needs to access data from Salesforce, Vertifor, Applied. Like... It shouldn't be that hard via API to pull like just basic account info from all three of those systems and put it into one interface. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe be. Salesforce as, as well. Like, well, yeah, but like if it's like, hey, I don't need to have a thousand fields. I don't need to have everything that ever happened under the history of the sun with this account. I just need to know the account names so that my producer can know like whether the accounts in our books already. Yeah, you know, like there's 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 some things you can do. So I, again, I'm not an expert on data warehouse. I just I hear it a lot. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me. I think the biggest agencies are going after it. 2024, I'd be like, this is probably a theme that's going to continue is like data warehouse. And I don't know what it means for small agencies, um, but there's probably a thread there of like, how can you how can you leverage your data across multiple systems? And and I think to some extent, honestly, like, and I even chatting with uh, you know with Jason Cass. I know he's doing some stuff with tech to kind of like create this whole tech stack and ecosystem where it's basically what he's trying to do is get the tools to talk to each other better mm-hmm. so you can have better flows, more integrations. And I think that's it's kind of a similar idea um, is like, you know, integrations. Um, you're trying to have like a unified experience. Yeah. I think for smaller agencies, less, more accurate data is always is the answer. You don't need like people 100%. are like, well, what? I need to know the I need to have the liability limits in my AMS. Do you really? Do you really need to know the liability limits in the AMS? Because one, if you're a small agency, all you need to do is sell more insurance. Yes. That's it. And That's literally your job. Yeah. What policies they have? Maybe the policy numbers and effective dates. That's about all you need for the policies. And then basic contact information, etc. Like and notes around the account. You don't really need anything more than that to cross sell, upsell, to service the accounts, and then to know where else to go to write more insurance. Like, and I think we get bogged down sometimes, especially someone who's who's who is you know growth focused, maybe technology focused, et cetera, maybe younger to the industry, not necessarily young in age, but younger to, and they're coming, be coming from another space, and they've seen what other industries can do, and they're like, well, I need to know this and this, and it's like you don't get the basics, have the basics be accurate. And, just, and as you said, sell more insurance. If the tool is not helping you sell more insurance, then it's it's not valuable you, to you until a certain point, until optimizing your book becomes rele- relevant. So, okay, awesome. I love this. Data warehouse, data lake, structured, unstructured data. I love it. Um, and, and I completely agree with you. It's an issue of economics. I, I, I Because I can't not go to contextual when it's there. I was, there was a post on this, um, uh, economic like Instagram channel that I follow called financials simplified. And it was a, it was a graphic uh, meme and it was um, 85% of all uh, 85% something like 85% of all um, uh, uh, post 40 research goes into 
erectile dysfunction, yet only 19% of men have erectile dysfunction, where only 15% of post-40 research goes into PMS and menopause, yet 100% of women, uh, you know, experience PMS and menopause. And I was like, and, you know, and, and the point of the thing was like, men will pay to make sure, men will pay anything to make sure that this function in their body is operating properly. And it's, and it was like, you know, his point, it's a guy that puts this channel together, I think. Um, and, and he, uh, I'm, I'm, that is a, I don't know that for a fact. Um, but, uh, it was just, his point was like, the research goes where people will pay. And if you can't do that function and you're a dude, you will pay just about anything to make sure that you can. And that's why the research was there. It was just, it was funny. I don't know. And I saw it 10 minutes before we went live. So that's why I was on my head. Um, okay. Uh, erectile dysfunction aside. Maybe, maybe you can put that, in the, put that in the show notes for the listeners to go check out the graph. Yeah, yeah. So they can be like, what the hell is Ryan talking about? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, okay. What else, what else did you have? Well, I think, so I think the next thing, you know, obviously, you know, insurance just in general, I think like, um, hard market, like, um, that, that's been a massive change for those of us who's been around for more than 10 years in the industry. Like we've never seen this before. Um, so I think like, that's just a theme. Like, so let's talk through a couple of things I see in insurance. So hard market, obviously one with just like the cash in the system. Um, I think like housing, commercial real estate is like interesting that, that that's already happening. And like, if you're listening, like you're probably yeah, duh. Um, and again, I think that's like an economics problem because insurance is driven by economics. Like there's a ton of free, there was a ton of free cash and now there's not, and there's less capacity. There's less surplus at these insurance carriers. They don't like, they can't sell as much insurance. Um, I think like, what are some of the impacts we might see from that? I'd be curious if like, insur- I, I'm hearing this actually, that um, some insurance companies are forcing agents to use portals as opposed to raters. It's been a theme forever, but like almost, almost like now it's like, hey, if you come to our website, you're more intentional mm-hmm. and we're trying to be more selective. And this is like now like a decision driven by the economics of like who's the best uh, client for an insurance company, most profitable, you know, least likely to lose customers. So like what are some of the Im- impacts of like hard market um, what are like, it'll be interesting to see like what the carriers do. Cause I think if you're an insurance carrier, you need to implement multiple strategies to make sure that you are writing the best economic business. Um, so I think some will be solved with tech. Um, I think that, you know, you might, I think you're going to see, I know one of my a person that I know started a venture capital firm focused on wildfire startups. I think you're going to see better, you know, you're going to see some tech out there for better underwriting. Um, I think you know, the insurance industry has been behind a lot of things like two-factor authentication on computers. It's like, if you don't have two-factor authentication, you can't get cyber insurance anymore, right? If you don't have airbags, anti-theft, anti-lock brakes, you can't like get car insurance. If you don't have building codes and sprinklers, like we can't insure your restaurant. I think in the construction industry, there's so much opportunity um, to be building better buildings. And I think, you know, you'll continue to see that yep. in, more push just from the economics perspective. I think, um, you know, self-driving cars, Waymo did over 700,000 trips with no human behind the wheel last year, mm. um, which it's like no human behind the wheel. <laughs> um, and so it's like this thing that, that has been promised forever is like full self-driving level five, which maybe, you know, and again, just I guess for high level for your, for the listeners, level zero, no driving automation, right? Level one, you have driver assistance. It's like adaptive cruise control. Um, level two is partial driving automation. So it's like you, your car can steer and do the speed control like in a traffic jam. Like when it pulls you off the rumble strip automatically, right? Like you get a little yeah, close I and mean, it I don't, pulls you back to center. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm not an expert on the different levels, but I think it's, yeah, more or less. The car can kind of steer for you in a yep. traffic jam. Um, probably like what a Tesla does. Level three, conditional driving. It's like the car can do all aspects of driving you can take your hand off the wheel and your eye off the road. That's level three mm. in most situations, but you gotta be ready if the car beeps at you to tell you to take over. Level four, high driving automation. It means the car is fully autonomous in most situations. So when I was driving back in a snowstorm, it's like, hey, the car probably couldn't do that. You know, at level four, but level five, it's like, no, the car could do full automatic. Don't need to have a driver anymore. Drive you in the snowstorm. Um, maybe we never get to level five, um, but like clearly, Clearly, when there's 700,000 trips with no human behind the wheel, it's like something is interesting is happening. And yeah. when you look at insurance, like I have a whole thing on triggers to shop for insurance. Why do people buy insurance? 
a lot of the times, most of the times, it's because a government body is requiring you or a bank is requiring you to buy insurance. Yeah. So car insurance, you get a car, government requires you to buy insurance. You know, what's the impact of having 700,000 trips and no driver behind the wheel? That's something I think about. Um, what does that mean for our industry in the next five, 10 years? And, uh, and I think just like electric cars in general, um, there's a lot of regulation about, I think in Massachusetts, apparently, like they won't be allowed to sell gas cars in 2035, which it's like, it's crazy because you're like, how is this ever going to work? Like the economics are going to work at this? No. Um, are, are there enough batteries that are out there? Are people going to want them? It's like a regulation as opposed to a market demand. But I think like the, our grid's not ready. You're already seeing issues with like fires from batteries. Um, you know, scooters had the same thing. I know I had read in Norway, um, a shipping company banned electric cars from going on the ferry. And Norway is like one of the biggest purchases of electric cars in the world. And the, and the ferry operator was like, it's, it, it's a critical, you know, the risk is too high, basically. Yep. Um, and so like if, if people are like, hey, if you have a bunch of electric cars together and one catches on fire, like this is not good. And so we're in, in the insurance industry, like underwriting. Um, and it's not just it's not just cars. You're going to have the Tesla power walls in the house. I had read recently about a stove, a startup that builds a stove that has like a giant battery inside of it because it can it can heat your water faster. And it can also like recharge your, your house when the power is low. Like, so there's just, and it's like, what are the new risks that come from that? So I think, you know, what if you're plugging your car in to be the generator for your house? If you have like one of the new F-150s or whatever, there's just a lot of things with like cars, self-driving cars, batteries, second, third order effects that it's like, these are going to be questions on your, on your application, right? Like, do you, do you use your car as a generator? Like that should probably be a question on home insurance and auto insurance if it isn't already. Or you know may, may, maybe it would in the future. So these are some of the things on, on the insurance side between hard market, you know technologies that can solve it, self driving cars, EVs that I've kind of thought would be interesting for 2024. Yeah, I think I, I love the idea. And again, I think this goes all the way back to the beginning of our conversation. We were talking about as a leader. Again, if you're if you're grinding out in a production role and you're you haven't hit escape velocity in your life yet. Don't worry about any of these things. Write more insurance. Like, don't waste your time. And I ask me that if you're an entrepreneur starting a company, you're you're in your production career, et cetera. Don't worry about these things. Don't think about these things. Like, right? Think about tactics. Think about strategy. Think about prospecting. You know, et cetera. But if you're a leader, unless you're a niche specialist, Ryan, I know you love niches. Oh um, my gosh, yeah, I love it. If, if, <laughs> talk about taking a shot. I couldn't. I couldn't help myself. Yeah. I. Uh, um, I, I couldn't help myself. We can get to that in a second. We can get to that in a second. I, but um, if you're a niche specialist in electric something with insurance, like maybe you should pay a little bit more. Yeah, attention yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if, it's your, if it is your target market, et cetera. But like you think about second and third order effects, like I have, uh, so I, I'm renovating a home uh, that I, I live in currently. Uh, very excited. Uh, Post-divorce, had an apartment, finally got a house, but uh, uh, needed some renovation, doing that. Okay. So Something I didn't realize when I purchased the house is that uh, we are actually be slightly below the water table in our basement. Now, it's not bad, and we're not in like a high volume water area, but at all times, water is trickling into the home. And, you know, every, depending on how, what's going on, every 15, 20 minutes, some pump kicks on, pushes the water out. Okay, great. Don't currently have a, a generator. It's something I have to do, but just, you know, of all the things I have to do, I haven't got there yet. If the power went out today, in about five hours, that would overflow into my basement. So I have a backup battery powered sump pump as well, which would get me 24 plus hours on the backup. So it's not like I'm completely out to lunch. But the idea here is, uh, look at California, right? As they push towards uh, EVs only, the power grid cannot sustain it. We do not have the capabilities. And because for some reason, climate changers don't, won't embrace nuclear, or nuclear, or what, however you properly pronounce it. Um, I want to do the other way than George Bush, which I always forget what it is. Um, you know, since 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 nuclear power is something that we seemingly can't wrap our head around, there is no way to produce enough electricity for every, even every American, let alone the world, to have an electric vehicle. Not even close. Not even ten percent. So like, or a heat pump in your home, yeah. or a battery backup. So so when we're talking second, third order effects here and just things to consider and that the insurance industry, and this is why I love the industry that we're in because it's ever evolving to what's coming. So say rolling blackouts become an issue, which if the Democrats have their way is most likely going to be in our future. 
Um, well, probably all of our establishments because Nikki Haley would do it. I mean, just to that point, like my, my furnace is breaking, Ryan, and I have a gas furnace and like there's big subsidies to put an electric yes. heat pump and an electric water heater in the house. Yes. And it's like, you, like literally the government would pay like half the cost yep. and give me 0% loan. If you do gas, it's like you have to pay it 100%. There's no subsidy. And it's like, okay, like we have gas. It's already here. And so what you're saying is we're going to have a, an electric vehicle. We're going to have an electric heat pump for heat and air yep. conditioning. We're going to have electric heat pump for water heating. All this stuff. Yeah, what's it all add up to? And if right? you don't like, eat your ready. bug and, pills, Peter, they're going to turn off the power and you are out. Uh, no, and it, yeah. I, you know, you think about these things. I mean, and if you're paying with your digital wallet yeah, that the government yeah. controls and they're going to shut you off like Canada did with the truckers, exactly, right? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. This is the conspiracy yeah. theory part. This is why you have to bury all your gold around the county in which you live. Um, <laughs> the, uh, like, like Ron Swanson from Parks and Rec. No, I, I do think I do think it's interesting. Like you look at um, like areas that have been dammed, right? I mean, you, again, not to bash California because not all of this were, were Democrats in California. Republicans did this too. But what they've done with their water supply and how they've dammed off different different water systems and different things have drastically impacted water issues related to California, which, you know, in part, in part, you know, some would say have played a role in some of the wildfires because, the, you know, rivers don't flow the same. They've changed ecological systems. Okay. I know it's not the only reason, whatever. My, my point is not who's to blame or what it is, but there are many decisions being made at all times and there are second and third order decisions. And as leaders in our company, I think that's where we need to spend our time is thinking what's happening today. And then if this, if X happens, then how do I make sure that my business is set up to sustain such a thing? As something I've been- But you were gonna, fit, I interrupted you. You were just gonna say that if the battery, the power went out for a certain amount of time, like your house is gonna flood. Right? Yes. And, that, and that's kind of my, my thing is like, okay, let's say I'm a, let's say I'm a homeowner's insurance carrier and I know that you have some whack job communist Democrat like Kathy Hochul running the state, right? Who is who has literally said electric uh, gas stoves. She's the same one who just shut down non-competes, right? Yes. And it's putting an exit tax into our state. How shitty a fucking leader are you if you have to put an exit tax into your state so that people don't leave? All right, that's another point. But my but the thing is she is passed a, she is passed initial legislation. No, she shut down the, I was saying she shut down the non-compete so they weren't going to be a thing in New York. Yeah. I thought like, yeah. Right. That was like a big deal. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I think, I think. Anyway. There, so, I can't remember if that got B and it's now being repositioned or something's going on. But oh yeah, this, we do, we, New York is going full communist and you know, it's working out really no, well. I, I just, not, not to beat a dead horse here, but I thought non-competes, it was like, it was going nationwide. And then New York was like, no, no, no. Like we, we need non-competes. Oh, I thought Kathy was, no. like, was like, we're keeping that. No, the no? other way. We're, I'm yeah. pretty sure that, I'm pretty sure that, uh, I'm pretty sure the big eye of New York was fighting the fact that New York wanted to go. So in California, if you hire a producer in mm -hmm. California, which I did not know, yeah. I had, at one time I had three producers. No non-compete. Great guys. Uh, yeah. This is not an, an indictment of them. Just in doing research and having people in California, which I had never had an employee in California before, they could at any given time say, hey, I'm out, take their entire book with them, move it to someone else, move it someplace else, and there was literally nothing I could do. When you say take their book, I mean, they, they would have to actually like solicit them, have them sign BORs. Yes, whatever. but I mean, I could not go, I could not go after them for taking their right. book with them, right? Like, yeah, there's not like, like a document they sign, but like they could yeah, just say, hey, yeah. come over, come over, come over, come over, come over. And that would be nothing I could do. New York is headed that way if Hochul gets her way. And but so, 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 yeah, go ahead. To finish my point on this, on this electric thing. So say you have, regardless, it could be whoever. Say you're in a state that is huge, that's doing all this electric stuff. And you know yeah. from past experience, looking at California, looking at some of the Norwegian states, et cetera, that when you over-index on electric, you get rolling blackouts. So now you're looking at homeowners, you're looking at your homeowner's book going, Oh my gosh, if it's the winter time in upstate New York and they start getting rolling blackouts, what happens is now you start to have frozen pipe issues, you start to have flooded basement issues, you start to have um so what happens you get uh, all kinds of shit with the eaves because the water starts to melt because the heat's, you know, the heat issues and then it freezes yeah, underneath yeah. the eaves. So like it, you know, this is a second or third order problem to the to, you know, someone just you know, some legislator being bought by the by the uh, by by whoever's buying up um, all these politicians around this electric stuff, and saying, "Okay, we're going to make our state this fully electric by 2035." Yet we do not have the infrastructure to do it. You get rolling blackouts, and all of a sudden, homeowners' claims go up. Um, you know, that's the kind of thing that I think we have to be thinking through. And what makes our industry so interesting 
is because now that's a problem that we have to solve and protect our clients against, which continually makes the insurance industry relevant and important to the, you know, sustainability of, you know, our lives. Absolutely. Um, I think like it's, it's, it's not a pure market adoption. It's like an accelerated adoption. And when you have accelerated adoptions, like there's impacts. And I yeah. think it's hundred percent, all these things are pretty interesting. I, I was chatting with a friend of mine recently. He has an electric car. He's in a condo association. He's like, we need to install hookup pedestals so you can plug your car in. What are the insurance impacts of like, installing you know electric pedestals in the condo association from a liability perspective and it's there's interesting questions um so i think a lot to be aware of i think you know the the, the insurance companies that are out there like they don't have to ask questions on the underwriting right away because they'll look at the claims data yeah um but the, but i think you need to be aware of like hey high level what are some trends that are happening oh electrification's a theme what are some of these second third order impacts Oh, let's let's go reanalyze our claims and be like, was there a, an incidence of like, you know, it, was there some sort of data that can tell us about incidents about an uptick in freeze ups because of heat pump systems failing yeah. and not having a backup, something like that. Yeah. And like, and, like, let's go analyze our claims and see if this is like, if there's something there. And I think you made a point earlier as well. If you're an agent, you can look at these things and say, can I talk to my carriers, find out who maybe is looking out ahead at electric vehicles, electric, you know, electric appliances inside of homes and become an expert or find some way to prospect these types of people who are building homes this way or are improving their homes in this way. And can I be the agent or agency for that type of client? And I, and I think, you know, again, we can use these things in as both from prospecting and from risk management, et cetera. Um, but I think it's really interesting. Before you go, um, and I know we're getting close to the number and I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, I want to just hear a little bit about Wonderite. I'm a big fan. We were a client for almost three years at, at Rogue Risk. Uh, I love what you're doing. I love you as a leader. And uh, I'm obviously uh, always trying to promote Wonderite just because I think it's a great tool for the industry. But tell us a little bit about what's going on and uh, what you're up to. Ryan, we didn't even get to AI yet, so we'll have to save that for another Yeah, another we'll have day, to come back. But, yeah, uh, yeah, we'll come back on AI. Let's come back on AI. Yeah. Um, no, so no, th things with the Wonderite, you know, they're going great. We, um, we have a, a, an integration we've been working on with Vertifor, direct integration. Um, and it's, it's in production with a number of agencies. It's really cool to see. We've put a lot of time into it. Um, that's been a big thing we've been doing. And, um, but yeah, I think, you know, big picture, what is Wonderite for those who aren't aware? It's like the fastest and easiest way to complete insurance applications, supplementals, yeah. uh, accords, whatever. You, you literally just type in the name of the form you're looking for and chances are we already have it in our forms library. We have over 6,000 forms. Um, and so you, you can instantly share it with your customer the same way you would share like a Loom video. It's so fast, it's so easy or, or anything like a Dropbox link. You just share the link or you send them an email. They can fill out the form digitally at Wonderite. I went through this with my own family agency. We bought a, a bigger, you know, tech, you know, cyber liability policy. I literally was sitting in bed at 10:30 at night, filled out a few quick questions, assigned the cyber questions to my VP of engineering. He answered them, and then I signed the document with like Wonderwrite's equivalent of DocuSign. Um, it goes back to the agency, and with the Vertifor integration, it can automatically like put that back into your agency management system, system of records. Like that's exciting. Um, I think that's like a big thing. Another big thing we've had going on is, you know, cross form mapping. So let's say you are marketing cyber insurance, you fill out one application you know, with travelers because it's a hard market. You want to go to multiple markets. You want to like be the first to market so that you're not getting beat out by a competitor. Um, we can map the data from one form to like five other forms. And that's a it's, it's a huge undertaking to get that right, because if you're familiar with like the AI tools that are out there, you have to have like this level of precision and it's tough to do well. So we, we built that tooling about a year ago and we've been rolling it out slowly um, across our forms library. It's like that's pretty exciting as I think about not just filling out like a cyber form, but let's say like a single intake form that isn't even tied to a PDF or a supplemental. But now you can take that data. And this was kind of the whole thesis of Wonderite is like capture the data once and then use it like infinitely wherever you need it to be used. Yeah. And so that's like a pretty exciting thing that's out there. Yeah, um, I know, right kind of um, uh, towards the end with Rogue, we had uh, we had dropped DocuSign and we were using Wonderite as our, as our uh, e-sign tool, which, you know, I know that's not your primary value proposition, but, you know, in conjunction with these forms, you don't, you know, with a lot of other tools, you have to export the forms 
and then import them into the east side and then send them out and you know it was saving us a tremendous amount of time and to your point just just data quality in different places we we just we would build everything into wonderwrite and then you know any questions we didn't gather in the initial kind of you know if you're thinking through if anyone's been listening to me around my one call close system right we try to gather everything we can anything we missed we said we would send out two or three questions that we needed answered just from the wonderwrite form that would come back market it once we had our you know whoever we were going with bam we just send it right out of that system back for e-sign and it just created a, a much easier flow one of the things that was very important to me or is very important to me um, when I'm bringing on any piece of software technology that I do not think we think about enough is how easy is it to train my team on this tool? And that was one of the things that I really liked about Wonderwrite is that uh, it was like finger snap easy to train. You know, there are tools that are really, really well done. uh, And I'm not, you know, not knocking anyone else, like tools that have tons of firepower are great for your agency, but it might take three months for someone to become comfortable using the tool and for me personally how easy it is to train my team on a tool is a is a really important data point when i'm making a decision on what to use and i found that to be the case with wonder right so uh dude no, I, yeah i was just saying i pre- appreciate you mentioning that i think like that was something that was critical for us um even like in the software, we we actually wanted something you could try for free, and we didn't have that originally. When you signed up, you couldn't try Wonderwrite for free because it, it wasn't easy enough. Yeah, it's actually easy enough now, I think. And so we actually turned on. This is new for us as well. Is we have a free trial. You can use Wonderwrite for free today for 14 days, and we have um, we open a power producer pricing for like one user. So it's literally like we we wanted to have something that was the easiest thing to buy. You don't even have to talk to a salesperson. You can try it. Um, and, and we're seeing really good conversions from people that they, they sign up, they try it. Um, cause I think when I was at my age, it's like, that was like, you just want to try it yourself. And if you can figure it out in like 30 minutes, you're like, all right, like, let's give this a shot. Yeah. Um, so that's like a, something else that's big for us, but yeah. It's definitely. tough to pitch the boss on a tool that you've never actually had your hands on before. You know, like if you've never actually gotten in and used it and you want to bring oh, yeah. it to the boss and say, Hey, I think this is something we should integrate in the agency. It's, it's almost impossible to make that pitch if you haven't if you haven't actually had had a chance to like get your hands in there and use it. Yeah, especially in this climate where like there's so many tools. That's another theme for 2024 is like, hey, what tools are going to stick it out? But there's so many tools and like everybody's looking at belt tightening and like, hey, what am I doing with, my, with our expenses? Yeah. What are we keeping? What are we cutting? Yeah, I love it. Dude, um, well, now I, I want to bring you back in to talk about the AI thing, but I also want to be cognizant of your time and of the audience's time. I appreciate the hell out of you. I love our conversations. Uh, big fan of what you're doing at Wonderwrite, have been from the beginning. And then uh, any chance we get IRL to to dive deep into conspiracy theories is also uh, <laughs> is also um, a fun time for me because you're one of the few people who will placate my uh, absurd, uh, absurd viewpoints on certain topics. And, uh, and I appreciate that about you. So thank you so much, man. Oh, that's the best. Hey, thanks for having me. And yeah, I can't wait to uh, to go deep and you know, uh, scratch that itch, that curiosity itch, which I think is what it is. You're pretty, it's like pursuing curiosity, yeah. right? And thinking critically. So a hundred percent. All right, brother. Be good. All right. Take it easy. I'm going to shaboom.